hey guys welcome back to my channel so this is the part three of surviving the maniac Y for 20 years for those of you that have not seen the part one and part two you need to just pause this one and go back and start from part one that's if you want to if you want to understand the story but other than that you are free to continue watching this part three there's a playlist in the in the description I made that playlist so that it will be easier for everyone to navigate, you know, and not stress yourself too much. So, if you're ready like I am, let's get into this part three. Let's do this, guys. Part 11. How my perfect 20-year marriage abruptly came to an end. It's January 2020. My wife is now almost done with all her requirements for school. She's now in a position where she's about to start working and now contributing to the household. We're in the development of having our own TV show. We have three wonderful children. I mean, life couldn't be better at this point in our life. And then we get a call from Tennessee. Mom is sick. We don't know if she's going to make it. You guys need to get up here. Okay, great. We're on our way. No problem. So we load up the kids. Now we got to drive to Tennessee. Not realizing this would be the last weekend that we would spend together as a family. This would be the last weekend that we would be together as a couple. So we get to Tennessee and immediately there's drama because this is years after the show and my wife is still not talking to her sisters. And as a matter of fact, she refuses to even be in the room with them when she visits her mom. So we have to wait for her sisters to leave before we go in and check on mom. After some time, over that weekend, it turns out mom is pulling through. We think she's going to be okay. There's some complications, but we think mom's going to pull through. She's going to be all right. So it was a quick trip. We had to turn right back around and get back to Texas because the kids got to get back to school. I have to get back to work. So we're on the road driving back to Texas. And I'm starting to notice what I've seen so many times before, we're going into another manic episode. Okay, no problem. I've seen this before. I know how to, I'm a master at navigating manic episodes. No problem. We can get this done. Uh, except this one is different. This, this one is manic episode on level 10. It's something different about this one. But I'm saying to myself, you know what? We, Her mother is in a situation. We didn't know if she was going to make it. I totally understand. But I tell you what, she... So one of the signs that I would regularly see when I know we're going into a manic episode and I have to step into manic management mode is she, in addition to what I already told you, the the crazy sex, she gets overly communicative. And so I'm noticing on this drive back, she is on her phone and she is sending text messages as long as my intro to this story. She is chopping away. She trying to light fire on that phone. And I'm looking like, whoa, my God goodness but once again this is a uncanny situation we don't know you know mom is in a bad place so i'm like doing the normal thing that i do buckle down i got to make sure the kids are taken care of make sure everyone's good and we'll get through this and then later on tonight i might get some of that wild you know so we get back home it's a sunday night Kids got to go to school in the morning. I have to go to work. Put everybody to bed. It's a normal night. I get up the next morning. 
my normal routine, get the kids ready for school, go to work. It's a normal day. She's at home. She's resting. I know it's been a long weekend for her. So I go to work, normal day at work. Uh, and at this time, I was working Uber as well. So I would work my regular nine to five. And then from like five until midnight, I would drive Uber just to make some additional income. So I'm I'm grinding. So I do my normal thing. I get off my regular nine to five. Then I click my Uber on. All right. Now it's time to go to work. Then I start getting calls from the kids. Kids blowing my phone up, texting me, calling me. I'm like, kids, what's going on? Dad, we we hungry. Where's mom at? We don't know where mom is. I'm hungry. I want something to eat. Dad, can you please come home? And I'm like, okay. Um, let me call your mother real quick. I call my Denise, where are you? I, I can't, I'm calling her. I can't get a hold of her. I have no idea where she is. I'm calling. She's not picking up the phone. She's not picking up text messages. And I'm like, what is going on? Some time goes by and I'm like, okay, I got to go home and take care of the kids and make sure they're good. So I reroute. I'm on my way home. Great. Now I get a call from my wife. Ring, ring. Oh, hey, babe. Yeah, everything is good. I got the kids. Yeah, babe, where you been at? The kids been calling me. They saying they hungry. They said they can't find you. What's going on? Like, is everything okay? Yeah, I'm good, baby. Sorry. I'll make sure the kids get something to eat. Everybody's good. Okay, great. No problem. Fantastic. So I go back to doing my regular grind. Now I'm driving. I'm thinking everything at home is taken care of. Well, I decide to end a little early tonight. So it's around 11 o'clock. I drive home like I normally do. I get home and I pull up. Nobody's home. Kids not home. Wife not home. Car's gone. Where is everybody? Where's my family? It's 11 o'clock at night. It's a school night. The kids got to go to school in the morning. Where is everybody? Okay. So I'm scrambling. I'm looking around like, where's my wife? I'm calling her. She's not picking up the phone again. What's going on? So um, she was sick over that weekend. Like she had a cold and her throat was hurting really bad. So I'm thinking maybe she went to the hospital. So there's an ER that was about a mile down from where we live. So I drive to the hospital. She's not at the hospital. And I'm freaking out at this point. Like, where is my family? So I don't have any other choice. I, I can't figure out where they are. So my only option is just to drive home. So I drive home. I get home. And guess who pulls up at the same time that I do? At midnight. My wife with the children in the car. Now the children are buzzing when they get out the car. Oh yeah, they getting out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm upset at this point. And my wife and I rarely argue and I rarely get upset, but I'm looking at her like, what? I'm really upset with you. Where were you? I couldn't get a hold of you. What was going on? You had me extremely worried. I'm thinking like, where's my family? And the kids got to go to school in the morning. What is going on? Here's where it gets really bizarre. She's not talking to me. She's whispering. She, because supposedly her throat hurts too much to actually talk. And so she's whispering, I'll talk to you in a minute. I'll, don't worry, I will tell you. And I'm like, will you talk to me and tell me what was going on? I was extremely worried. And she's still whispering, I'll tell you what's going on. Da, da, da. So she's not giving me any information. Okay, so we get in the house. I'm pissed at this point. We get in the house and put the kids to bed. And I tell her like, okay, are you ready to talk to me now? Because you need to let me know what's going on. Where were you tonight? And why were you out so late? And why couldn't I get a hold of you? Everything's going to be okay. Don't worry. And this is just driving me through the roof, all this whispering. So then she's talking about my throat hurts too much. I'm going to write a note. So then she write notes. But she writing these notes without, I don't, like, it's not giving me any information. 
She writing notes and just scribbling down jargon that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And I'm almost out of time on this video, so I'll pick it up on part 12. I know that some of you might be driving while listening to this or doing something. So I'm going to read out this receipt that Mr. Rock dropped. He already spoke about it, so let me just read the text message. So the year of this text was in January of 2020. So I think I don't think the first one is from when they were having issues. She said, emergency ish. Are you free to text five minutes, papi? So, but this next one is from January of 20, 2028, 2020, around 7.12 p.m. Keith calling me frantic, wondering where you are. So, I guess he's the one sending. So, he sent again. They say they are hungry. No response. He sent again. Hey, he, he muted the, he covered the name. Where are you? No, re okay, respond now came. No worries. I'm driving up now. Please give me a moment so I don't have to text while driving. See you at midnight. XO, XO. Where did she go to that? She's coming back at midnight. He now responded. Did you make it home? Where are you? She said she was coming back by midnight because he was in texting around 7.39 p.m. Wow. So let's just go back to the story, guys. So this is the first receipt we are seeing. Let's get back into the story. Part 12. Where were you last night? I was looking for you. I'm calling you. What's, what is with all this whispering? You got to tell me what's going on. Okay, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what's going on. She's still writing notes. She's writing notes. And the notes aren't giving me any information. So eventually the kids go to sleep. Kids go to sleep. I give up. She goes, and it's about two o'clock in the morning at this point. We arguing back and forth, but she's not giving me any information. She's not even talking to me. She's just writing notes. And I'm like, I couldn't find you guys last night. I'm I'm just at this point, I'm just mad. It's about two o'clock in the morning. She goes and locks herself in the bathroom. When she locks herself in the bathroom, she start making all these crazy noises that sounded something like ah, and I'm like, what is going on in that bathroom? But she has the, but she has the door locked. And I'm exhausted at this point. So I go to sleep. So this is Monday night. I get up Tuesday morning. She's still locked in the bathroom. Okay. She comes out of the bathroom all wet. Like, I guess she took a bath, all night bath. I'm not even asking about the noises. I'm, I'm just so exhausted and I'm trying to figure out what was going on last night. So she's still whispering and not giving me any information and not giving me any information. And she's still writing these doggone notes. And I'm getting extremely frustrated at this point. So I'm still fighting and trying to get some information out of her. I'm not getting anything. Now, one thing that I told you guys, that what did I tell y'all that comes along with the manic episodes is the crazy sex. So in the midst of me, arguing and trying to get some information out of her all of a sudden now guess what she wants to have sex now i told y'all that the manic sex is off the chain this is on a whole nother level as we going into it she pushing me around she throwing me on the bed she just it is wild and she asking me to do all this wild stuff to her and I'm like, yo, like, I know I was upset about whatever you were last night. But now at this point, I'm like, OK, well, at least this is my treat that I get for dealing with this manic madness. So I'm like, OK, let's get into it. At a certain point, I get over top of her. 
when I get over top of her, I don't know what she was thinking. She reached up and grabbed me by the balls. And she started squeezing as tight as she could. And I start screaming like a baby. Ah, ah, let me go. And I'm screaming at the top of my lungs like, I don't know what to do. And she just gripping harder and harder and harder. And this is a moment that I will regret for the rest of my life. As long as the 20 years that my wife and I have been married, I never put my hands on her. But for whatever reason, I said, Janice, you need to let me go or I'm going to smack you. Why did I say that? When I said I'm going to smack you, she bared down even harder. And I'm screaming and I reared back and I smacked her. I regret that. I don't condone putting your hands on a woman. It, it was the only thing I could think of at the moment. I smacked her and then I declawed her nails out of my balls. She literally had me by the balls. And so now she coming at me. She trying to fight me. She trying to push me and it is just crazy. And I'm trying to get her off of me. It's just madness in the bedroom. So me screaming so loud woke the kids up because this is like five, six o'clock in the morning. So it woke the kids up, kids banging on the door. Dad, dad, are you OK? What's going on? What's going on in there? And through the midst of us tussling, for whatever reason, she stopped and laid down on the floor. Okay, now I'm telling the kids, kids, everything okay, we're going to be all right. I'm trying to get myself together, figure out, like, okay, what do I do? I leave out of the room, I close the door, and now I got to try to figure out my normal routine of taking care of the kids. So, kids, nothing's wrong, daddy just got hurt, I'm okay. Uh, let's get you guys ready for school. Okay. And the kids are crying. They don't know what's going on, but I'm just trying to reassure them that everything is okay. So I'm going through my normal routine, getting the kids together. And then all of a sudden, I hear the loudest screams coming out of the bedroom. Ah, ah, ah. And then I hear banging on the wall. Boom. Boom, 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 banging on the wall. And then the kids are freaking out at this point. So I go in the room and she is in the room completely losing it. She's on the floor and she is wailing back and forth, screaming, ah, ah, and banging on the wall. Boom, 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 bang, bang, bang. To this day, my daughter can't stand hearing loud bangs from that. Bang, she banging, boom, boom, ah. And I'm like, yo, what is going on? I am scared at this point. I was a master at dealing with the manic episodes, but nothing like this. So I'm fro, I don't know what to do. And the first person that I could think to call is my brother. So I call my brother on FaceTime. I don't remember if I called him on FaceTime or if I called him uh, 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 just on a regular phone. But I'm like, yo, bro, listen to what's going on. My wife is losing her mind, bro. And my brother's like, yo, you need to call 911. <laughs> And I'm like, I, I'm fr I don't know what to do. So I, I get 911 on the phone. They answer, okay, hi, uh, my name is Rock. I'm here with my wife. Uh, she has a history of mental health issues. And, um, I, you know, she's in a position where uh, she's unstable. And I need you guys to send someone out here. Okay, sir, is everything okay? Is this a domestic situation? No, everything's fine. She has a history of doing this. She's done this before. Okay, sir, um, 
you need to stay on the phone with us and we'll get the paramedics sent out there. Okay, great. Fantastic. Okay, let's let's just stay on the phone and just monitor. Is she doing okay? Yes, yeah, she's doing fine, this, that, and the other. So while I'm on the phone with the paramedics, she burst out of the room and she is coming at me with everything she got. She's swinging. She has some like little metal, uh, I can't think of what it was, but she's swinging it at me. She grabbed a broom and she's swinging a broom at me, trying to hit me with the broom. And then all the kids are around seeing all of this. And then my daughter had a blanket and she was holding the blanket up like, no, mom, don't, no, don't, don't hit dad. Don't do this. And I'm still on the phone with 911 and I'm trying to manage everything that's going on and get the kids out of the way. And it is just bananas. So eventually, somehow, we get her isolated back to the room. Now, the room, the door pushed out toward me. So I got my foot on the door because she's trying to reach around the door. She's trying to hit me around the door and just trying to get me. And I'm on the phone with the paramedic. And I'm trying to, I'm like, okay, y'all need to get over here. And then we get a knock on the door. And I'll tell you guys, I'm out of time. I'll tell you what happens next. Part 13, how my perfect 20-year marriage abruptly came to an end. So I got a knock on the door, but my foot's still on the door. She's still around the door, swinging at me, trying to hit me. And I'm still on the phone with the paramedics. She yelling through the phone. His name is such and such. He works at such and such. He's crazy. He needs help. Get somebody out here for him. Blah, blah, blah. My youngest son is at my legs punching at me. Daddy, daddy, leave mommy alone. So while I get this knock on the door, I'm like, okay, these are the paramedics. So I'm thinking if I let this door go, she's going to rush me. So I'm trying to think what to do. So my daughter's standing over there. I'm like, go answer the door. And the kids are just stunned. They they don't want to do anything. So I'm like, okay, I got to get this door. So I'm, I'm like, whatever. If she rushes me, she rushes me. So I let the door go. I go answer the door, thinking it's the paramedics. I open the door. I'm staring at a police officer. How you doing, sir? Uh, is everything okay? Um, can you tell me what's going on? What happened? And I'm like, okay, I explained to him just like I just explained to you guys. You know, my wife has the history of mental health issues and manic episodes. She, we were being intimate. She grabbed me by the balls. I smacked her and everything exploded from there. Police officer's like, okay, now while we're talking, we had walked to a certain part of the house where I could look in the bedroom. Now, just two seconds ago, I'm thinking she's about to rush me, but now we're standing right in front of the room where you can look inside and see the room and she's laying on the floor, butt naked. Because like I mentioned, we were just about to be intimate. So she still doesn't have any clothes on. So she's laying over the floor, not laying on the floor, not a stitch of clothing on. Police, myself and the police officer are staring inside. After I finished telling him my story, he says, okay, do you mind if I go in and speak with her? I'm like, okay, if you need to, go right ahead. He goes in the room. When he goes in the room, she getting up from the, you know, I could see her getting up like, you know, she dazed and confused. She was looking at the police officer and telling, you know, I guess tell, telling him whatever, you know, whatever she was saying. Because I couldn't hear. I could see inside, but I couldn't hear what she was saying to the officer. So after some time police officer came back and talked to me and said, yeah, we need to get some help in here. Do you want me to get the paramedics? I said, duh, that's the reason why I called in the first place. So now he leaves out to get the paramedics. And I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, we got to get some, some clothes on her. We got to get her covered up. So I'm asking my daughter, like, help me get her dressed. Let's try to get some clothes on mommy. You know, we're trying to get clothes on her, trying to, and she is, she not having it. She doesn't, she not letting us do anything. So I'm like, okay, well, let's at least put a blanket over her so she's at least covered up. Because at this time, she's still laying on the ground. So we put a blanket on her, and the paramedics come in like, 
four or five paramedics come in. They go directly to the room and they surround her. She's laying on the floor. They surround her. Okay, ma'am, are you okay? Is everything okay, ma'am? Uh, we're here to help you. And then after a while, she stands up and she's in the middle of the circle, butt naked, all these uh, uh, paramedics standing around her. And then it starts to get a little intense. And then it starts to get to be a little bit of pushing and shut. And it's just, it's starting to intensify. And they're like, ma'am, ma'am, you have to relax, ma'am. We're going to have to get you out of here, ma'am. You know, and then they came out and said, look, we're going to have to, we're going to have to close the door and deal with this. So they closed the door and I could hear from outside of the door, ma'am, we're going to have to take you out of here. Ma'am, do you want us to give you a shot? We're going to have to give you a shot to sedate you, ma'am, to get you out of here. And, and I'm hearing all this tussling going on. And then they're like, okay, yeah, let's give her the shot. Go ahead and give her the shot. And boom, I guess they gave her the shot because after a while, everything kind of settled down. They brought a stretcher in, wrapped a blanket around her, put her on the stretcher, strapped her to the stretcher. So then now they're wheeling her out of the house on the stretcher. They wheeled her right by me, and when they did that, she took her ring off of her finger and like, like licked it like that, like, and then looked me in the eyes. She threw the ring and looked me in my eyes and said, I'm divorcing you. And then I was like, okay, babe, like, I'll see you at the hospital. Because I'm thinking to myself, like, I've seen these manic episodes before. It's never been this intense, but I'm thinking she's just talking out of her mom. So they wheel her out. Now I'm standing here, it's just me and the kids, and I'm like, what just happened? And I'm just trying to figure out what are the next moves that I need to make. Okay, I can't, there's no way I can go to work today. Okay, uh, look, I got some situations going on at home. I need to take the day off. Okay, no problem. Go ahead and take the day off. So then now I got the kids. Now, originally, I was trying to get the kids to school before everything blew up. And so now I'm like, and this was a big mistake. I don't know what I was thinking, but I took the kids to school <clears throat> and I took my youngest to daycare, not thinking about the trauma they just experienced, but I'm just trying to piece together, like, how do I deal with this situation? So I get the kids to school, youngest to daycare. Now I got to go to the hospital and check on my wife. So I get to the hospital and when I go, how you doing? My name is... My wife is, she's here. Can you let me back to go and say, I'm here to check on her. Okay, what is your name, sir? Okay, one second, one second, sir. And I'm like, okay. And then I'm waiting a while. Like, okay, just one second, sir. And I'm like, why am I waiting? Like, just let me back there to go check on my wife. So then after some time, a police officer comes out. Police officer is started asking me questions. How are you, sir? Okay, yeah, I'm officer, such and such. And uh, could you explain to me what happened, uh, the situation that happened in your home? And then I explained them just like I just explained to you guys. Uh, yep, she, uh, you know, we were being intimate. She has a history of manic episodes and mental health issues. Uh, she grabbed me by the balls. I was in pain. I smacked her. I regret doing that. And uh, everything blew up from there. Okay, okay. Well, uh, she said you raped her, sir. And uh, did you forcibly put your thumb in her whatchamacallit? Wait, she said I did what? She said I raped her. Yes, sir. And did you forcibly put your thumb in her whatchamacallit? Well, yeah, I did. But she asked me to do it. Uh, and he's just going on and on about supposedly I raped her and did all these crazy things to her. And he's like, uh, so you're going to have to wait. She doesn't want to see you. She is not going to let you back into the room to see her. And uh, we have a detective on the way. And you're going to have to talk to the detective and explain to him what you just explained to me. Because right now, this is an investigation. Really? Okay. No problem. And we'll pick up the rest on the next part. Part 14. How my perfect... 20 year marriage abruptly came to an end. So I'm at the hospital. I'm talking to the police officers. They're saying this is an investigation, sir. And your wife is saying that you raped her. 
She's saying that you beat her, that you knocked her unconscious. Did you do all these things to her, sir? And I'm talking with the police officers and I'm going through the whole story, telling them exactly what happened. Then one police officer leaves and another police officer comes over. And then they ask me, can you tell me what happened, sir? Explain to me what's going on. Then I got to go through the story again with the next police officer. Okay, well, we're going to have to have a detective come out and talk to you, sir. Okay, no problem. Then I'm sitting there waiting for a long period of time. And then another police officer comes over and I have to give the whole story again. It was like three or four police officers came and spoke with me. And then I'm thinking like, are you guys ever going to let me check on my wife and see my wife? No, that absolutely cannot happen. Well, I said, um, because I knew obviously she didn't have any clothes on. She was butt naked when they took her out on the stretcher. So before I left the house to go and check on her, I had packed a bag with, you know, clothes and things that I thought she might need. I said, well, can you guys at least make sure she gets these items? Because when she left the house, she didn't have any clothes on. They said, OK, uh, that's a little odd for an abuser. I've never seen that before. An abuser actually come to the hospital to check on the person that they've abused. Uh, so, yeah, we'll but yeah, we'll make sure that she gets the bag. But based on what they were saying, I think they're understanding the story that I'm telling them. So now I get a call from the detective. The detective uh, wants to, you know, I'm running through the story with the detective. I'm telling him everything that happened. And he's like, OK, well, I need to come to the hospital to talk to you. Um, I need you to just stay there where you are. And it's going to take me. I think it was like I had to wait an hour, hour and a half. OK, no problem. Detective shows up to the hospital. I run through the whole story with him. And then he says to me, OK. Now it makes sense. He said, I spoke with her. And I spoke with your wife and what she was telling me, it was it was jumbled. It didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but now it makes sense because I went through everything with him. You know, last night, you know, uh, she had the kids out late. She was in the bathroom all night. Uh, we arguing. She's writing these notes. Uh, you know, then the next day we were intimate. She grabbed me by the balls. I smacked her. I went through everything. And then he said, OK, now the story is adding up. It's making sense. Uh, he said, the next step I want to go. I need to take I need to go to the house so I can take pictures and finish my investigation. Uh, I said, OK, no problem. But I asked again, how is she like? Where is she? How is she doing? Is she still here? And I hours. This was hours. I had been sitting at the hospital. He said, well, she's already been released from the hospital and she's actually on her way to get the kids. I said, there's absolutely no way y'all need to let her get those kids in the state that she's in. And after telling the detective the story, he totally understood, you know, with the history of mental health issues and things like that. He totally understood and agreed with me, but he said, I got to get you to the house so I can finish my investigation. So we drive to the house and at the same time that we pull up to the house, just by fate, my wife is pulling up at the exact same time. So now I'm standing on one side of the road. She's standing on the other side of the road. They're not letting us go in the house. Pol police officers over there talking to her. Then they come over there and talk to me. Detectives going over there talking to her. Then they come back and talk to me. And then the detective says, OK, I need to get a mental health officer to come out and talk to her. OK, great. Let's make that happen. So they have a after some time of waiting, a medical police officer came out, spoke with her. Then they came back over and spoke with me. OK, we're going to have to take her to get her some help. We can't disclose to you where we're taking her. Uh, she doesn't want to be here tonight. We do need to take her to get her some help, but we need to let her in the house to get some of her things, and then we'll let you go in the house. Okay, no problem. So then I see her going in the house. I guess she's gathering her items. 
she's coming back out and in the distance she's looking over at me and it was just a surreal moment and then boom she drives off and, and they did let me know we're not going to let her get the kids we are going to release the kids to you uh but once again the detective still needed to get in the house to finish his investigation so the detective comes in the house and I take them through everything in the house. Here are the marks on the wall where she was banging on the wall. This is what happened. And I'm showing him going through the whole story and showing him exactly where in the house everything was happening. Detectives in there taking a bunch of pictures, you know, filing, doing whatever it is that he has to do to get to the next process or the next step of his investigation. So now they, they leave, the detective leaves. Okay, I got everything that I need and uh, gives me a card. Uh, it's still an investigation, so we'll, we'll be in contact with you. Okay, great. Uh, now, I got to gather myself. Now I'm sitting in the house by myself, gathering my thoughts from everything that just happened. And now I got to get myself ready to go out and get the kids. And before I leave, I get another knock on the door. And I'll explain who that was in the next part. Part 15, how my perfect 20 year marriage abruptly came to an end. So the detective has gathered all the information that he needs, lets me know that he'll follow up with me about the investigation and leave. Now I'm sitting there by myself. I'm looking around at all the madness and the signs of the madness that just took place. My mind is spinning and I'm just trying to take a minute just to pull myself together. Before I could even get a chance to do that, I get a knock on the door. Okay, who's this? I go answer the door. Hi, sir. My name is such and such. I'm with Child Protective Services. I need to speak with you. Okay. Is it okay if I come in? Yeah, sure. Come on inside. Sir, I've gotten some information that you've been doing some inappropriate things with the children. Are you doing this, that, and the other with the children, sir? What? Absolutely not. What are you talking about? I mean, listen, where are you even getting this information from? If this is coming from my wife, I need to let y'all know she has a history of mental health issues. We just had a huge blow up the other day. She was taken to the hospital. And I don't even know where she is, sir. I can't disclose where I'm getting this information from, but we need to get the children to have a forensic interview done. I've already been the, to the school to talk to your children. You went to the school and spoke with my children. Yes, sir. I've already spoken with the children and you need to get them to a forensic interview. Uh, and also you can't take them. You're going to need to either we can take pick your children up and take them or you can find someone else that can do it. What? I can't even pick my kids up. Sir, you need to find someone else to do it or we need to pick the children. Listen, y'all not picking my kids up. I make a phone call to my friend. Listen, I'm having a day that you cannot believe. I need your help. I'm sitting here with CPS. They're talking about I need to get the children to an interview. Can you please help me? And they said it needs to happen today. I got you. No problem. Friend agrees. So they leave. My friend picks the children up. And now I'm waiting for what feels like forever. After some time, I get a call back from my friend. Listen, they said everything you said checks out. They're going to release the children back to you. I'm on my way back wonderful my children get back home and i just hug them and i'm praying with them and they're asking me where's mommy where's mommy that children i haven't heard from mommy i don't know where she is i'm sure she's okay let's just pray for her let's just pray and hope that she's okay that night we all just got in the bed i wanted everybody close we all got in the bed together just piled in the bed and we go to sleep. The next morning we wake up and now I got to be strong for the kids. I got to make sure they get everything they need. So I got to get my youngest to daycare. I got to get my two other children to school. 
Then I got to get to work, which was about a 30 minute drive. I go to work. I let my job know, look, I've got some personal things going on. I'm going to need to leave work early today because I got to get my kids from school. I don't have anyone else that can help me. I need to get the kids from school. Okay, no problem. Do whatever you got to do. They allow me to leave early. I leave that day, go back to get the kids, go home that night. Same question, Daddy, where's Mommy? Children, I haven't heard from Mommy. I don't know where she is. She's not answering any of my calls or texts, but we're going to be okay. We're just going to pray for Mommy. We all piled in the bed together that night. We go to bed. I get up the next morning. I got to do it again. And then the next day, I got to do it again. Then a week goes by, the same pattern. Still haven't heard from my wife. Then two weeks go by, I still haven't heard from my wife. Then three weeks, then a month goes by, still haven't heard from my wife, have no idea where she is. I'm just in this rhythm of picking the kids, taking the kids to daycare, taking the kids to school, going to work, leaving work early, back, getting the kids dinner in the same rhythm day after day. Still haven't heard anything. And I'm, I just I just don't know what to do at this point, but I'm just trying to stay in a good rhythm and be strong for the children. So then on one particular night, the kids, I'm trying to have a fun night with the kids. And we got this old iPad that one of the kids was like, oh, dad, I found that old iPad. I want to, uh, is it okay if I use the iPad? Sure, no problem. So I plugged the iPad up and, um, you know, after some time, you know, it charges up and it comes on. When the iPad comes on and I slide it open, all I hear is whoop, 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 whoop. I'm like, what is that? It's text messages coming in on the iPad. So then I, I, I click the messages and I see all these text messages. This is the iPad that's connected to my wife's phone. And I'm like, oh. And I begin scrolling through all the messages that I'm seeing. And she is saying the most salacious, heinous, evil, hatred things about me. Talking about me like I'm the worst person in the world. And the detectives are going to come get him. He thinks this is over. And this, that, and the other. CPS is coming after him. He's going to go to jail. And we got everything set up and lined up. And they're going to get him. And they're going to do this, 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 that, and the other. And I'm like. What is this that I'm seeing? And I just don't even know how to collect myself. Like, I'm like, what in the world is going on? And we'll talk about what happens next on part 16. I don't know. My heart breaks out for this man as he's telling his story. Just imagine being in one of the best places you could ever imagine as a married couple. Only for your life to take on a turn you never ever envisioned happening. My heart, like my heart, goes out to all the couples going through something like this. Well, guys, what do you think could have been the trigger to the wife's episode? What do you think could have been the, the trigger? Like, man, this marriage definitely did not end abruptly. Do you guys think it ended? I don't think it ended. It's 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 been a long time coming, and that whispering would have been so annoying. I can just imagine how the thing must have been eking him. I love how this man came out with so much receipt. Like he came prepared. He seems to be a smart person. He definitely learned a lot from that family show. If I do say so myself, I do not know what I do not know, but that smacking was definitely necessary if you ask me because that must have been very painful being held by the boss literally like literally i must have I'm just imagine the pain must have gone through and can we talk about those kids they must have been 
traumatizing and hearing their mom having that episode. Like, I'm just imagining what the, 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 the family dynamic would have, must have been like. I'm not even part of this story, but it is draining even just listening to it. Talk more of the children that, that were literally part of this story. But, it, but guys, why in God's name did he not request for a diagnosis from the doctors? I missed all their frequent, frequent visits to, to the hospital. Why didn't he request for a, a diagnosis? I don't even know. Do you guys think the wife secretly hated the husband or something? Because this is way more than just having a minor episode. You guys get This is where we'll end this part three. For those of you that have not seen the part one, I will encourage you to watch the part one. And also check the description box for a playlist. So it's much easier for you to navigate the story and you're able to keep up. Kindly like and subscribe. Take care of yourselves, guys. Bye.